right, you guys. Um, today we're doing our lecture on our very first right-hand page for this um, section. So it's going to go on to page 54 of your interactive notebook. And we're going to try to make as many connections between this new information and stuff that we've already learned. So if you did notes already out of the textbook, you have kind of an outline and you're going to want to flush it out with details. What you absolutely should not be doing right now is trying to label the skeleton or catch up on notes or something like that. You know, if you don't have the notes written down, then capture as much as you can, but try not to divide your attention between this and something else. Okay. So, um, skeletal system. Let's first look at the functions of the skeletal system. You're going to see little things coming up for each one of these, but then you're going to want to add details to it. And I'll be writing to help you. Okay. Support and giving shape to the body. Support, you know that we stand upright because of our skeletal system. Um, it allows us to stand upright. Have you guys seen the video online on YouTube of the bear that's walking around on, on two legs? It's hilarious. It's, um, the, the caption is like, this bear thinks he'll blend in better if he walks like a human. And so this bear is walking upright, holding his arms out. It, it's hilarious because it looks like a, a furry human. And it, it doesn't look bear-like at all. And the bear doesn't just do it for a little bit. It, on purpose, walks everywhere in the backyard um, in this video. For several minutes, walks around on its back legs. So look it up on YouTube. It's really funny. Bear walks like a human. Bears are very smart, and they learn things, and they see things and learn things. So probably that bear has been sitting in the woods observing the human that lives there and says, oh, I think, you know, I can, I can reach that. I can get up there. But it just, it walks around like, a, if you put a hat on it, it would look like a little old lady walking around. Do, 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 do. It's really funny. Shape to the body. The shape of our body changes over time. You know, when you're a little kid, first you're kind of straight up and down. And then when you go through puberty, your skeleton does change because of puberty. For males, testosterone makes your Adam's apple protrude. And for males, also, you get a more prominent brow ridge. For females, our hip bones, our pelvis rounds out. So, like, get wider for, for carrying a baby, right? Mm -hmm. Protection of internal organs. What structures are responsible for protecting internal organs? What do you think of when you think of protecting internal organs? The so, the rib cage. So, we have, for sure, the ribs. Oh, I should put that in white. So the ribs, and what do the ribs protect? The lungs. the lungs and the heart, good. And then we also thought of the skull, or better you said the cranium, and that obviously protects the brain. We also have our pelvic bones that help to cradle um, a developing fetus. So it gives some protection. All right, another function. The skeletal system helps to make movement possible. Please don't mistake that for movement, though. The skeleton is not responsible for actual movement. It helps to make movement possible. How? How does the skeleton help to make movement possible? Yes? Because muscles are attached to bones. And so movement is made possible because the muscles pull on the bones and then the bones act as a system of simple levers and that's what makes movement possible. So did you write that down? We've got levers, muscles attached to bones. Levers are a, a, what we call a first-class machine, a simple machine. Okay. Another function of the skeletal system is calcium storage. So I want you to think about where, where in a bone would calcium be stored? Well, before we answer that, can you remind me what type of tissue bones are? What are the four categories of tissues that we had? Epithelial. OK. 
connective. Okay, muscle and nervous. Of those four bone uh, tissue types, which one did bones belong to? Connective. connective. Okay, so now that we're thinking about connective tissue, what is a characteristic that we had common to our connective tissues? We had living cells surrounded by a non-living... What was that non-living material going around living cells? The matrix. Okay? So, the matrix in bones is the portion of the bone that stores the calcium. So, it's stored in the matrix. And I bring the histology back into this because you're, for a couple reasons. First of all, your final exam at the end of the semester is cumulative. It covers the whole semester. So you you do need to you do need to pay attention to the new stuff as well as the old stuff because it does spiral around. So in our bone matrix we have calcium salts. Question? Yeah. Do you know how um gives you calcium to your bone? Yes. Um, someone told me that that. At a certain point, milk becomes bad for you because your bones are fully built for all of so calcium that you need to get it's, it, No, you always need calcium because calcium is not just needed for bone development. It's also needed for muscles and muscle contraction. But they probably misunderstood the idea that once you're weaned, which means taken off of breast milk, you don't, you, you aren't typically going to drink milk anymore. Now, what kind of milk would a human drink? Cow milk. Really? Sweet. We're cows? Why does a cow make milk? To feed their baby. To feed their baby calves. too. So what kind of milk should we be drinking? Breast. Human breast milk. Human oh. breast milk. <laughs> and when do you stop drinking human breast milk? Once you're like three. Usually about a year. After you're born. After you're born. <laughs> I said three years. Okay, so shh. Human breast milk is actually really sweet has a lot of sugars in it and things like that. Like so healthy? humans make oh, breast yeah. milk to feed and nourish their babies. Cows make milk to nourish their babies. Now, what have we done? We milk cows and we drink cow's milk. Processed. Is that really a natural process for us? No. No. So why do we do it? Because we've been told milk, it does a body good, right? Yes. We've been told that it's healthy to drink milk, that you've got to drink milk because you've got to get your calcium. But are there other places that we can get calcium from? Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, a student last period said that almond milk actually has more calcium in it than, than cow's milk, and I'm not sure. Okay, so I'll have to check up on that. So do you guys understand what lobbyists are? No. Come on, you guys don't have a government? You haven't talked about lobbyists yet? Yeah. Okay. In, in government, when, when people want to get a law made, sometimes certain laws are beneficial to certain groups and some laws are, bene are not beneficial to certain groups. So the oil companies, the dairy board, they send people to Washington, to state government, to lobby for certain agendas like Hey, we, we've got proof here. The American Medical Association says you need to drink milk in order to be healthy. All right, children need to get so much calcium every day. Doctors don't say that the calcium ha that a child has to get has to come from cow's milk. They just say you need to get X amount of calcium every day. And what do most kids not want to eat? Vegetables. They're vegetables. Well, guess what? Vegetables, leafy green vegetables are a great source of calcium. So... If a kid won't eat their veggies, then at least they're going to drink their milk. And so, yes, kids need to get enough calcium. So, hey, if they're going to drink their milk, you get them to drink their milk. But there's a dairy lobby association that works for getting legislation that will help to make dairy farmers more money. And so programs are written, laws are enacted. Why are we not driving electric cars? Because the oil companies put so much money into government through lobbying 
that they've killed electric car programs, even though that we have the technology. If all the money had been put into, you know, building electric cars rather than building more pipelines, we would all be driving electric cars. Do you guys understand that money makes the world go round, right? Okay, so we need calcium. We don't have to get it from milk. You can get it from other things. But most of you don't get enough calcium, so you should drink your milk or take calcium pills, supplements, or start eating more of your leafy green vegetables. Do you understand what I'm saying? That it's really biologically not natural for us to drink milk. All right. I love me a glass of cold milk, though. All right. So those calcium salts are going to be stored in the matrix of our bone. Hemopoiesis, blood cell formation. That's a big, important vocabulary term. You are going to see it on your test. Hemopoiesis, blood cell formation. Hematopoiesis. Yeah. yeah, same thing. Hemato means blood. Okay, what blood cells are we forming? Red blood cells, is that it? And white blood cells. All right, any disorders in which we don't have enough red blood cells, those are different types of anemia. What are the disorders that we have associated with having bad white blood cells? A cancer of having bad white blood cells. Lou, leukemia. Okay, leukemia. So where would you have a cancer if you had leukemia? Is, where do they find the, the tumors? It can spread to your brain, but where does it start? Where do you, where do you make your white blood cells? What, what does it say up there? Functions of the skeletal system. In your bones. That's where you make your white blood cells, in your bones. Does anybody know what part of your bones? Yes, ma'am? In the red bone marrow. Exactly. In your bone marrow. So what's the treatment for leukemia? What do they do if you have leukemia? Okay, before they do a bone marrow transplant, they have to give you chemotherapy and radiation to destroy the cancerous bone marrow, which would make you severely anemic and immune compromised because now they've destroyed the thing that makes your white blood cells. So now you have basically no immune system at all. Then they hopefully, they gotta find you a, a, a donor that matches your blood type and your tissue type and they take healthy bone marrow out of the donor's bones with the needle and then they put that healthy bone marrow into the person who has the cancer. And ideally, it's going to grow there. That's a bone marrow transplant. You've heard about that before, right? Yeah. So now maybe you've connected it to a problem with the bone marrow. How would they find out that somebody has leukemia? They would, um, you would get sick and get sick over and over again and just never be able to get well. And then they look at your blood and you have like a... a crazy high number of white blood cells and then they look at your white blood cells and they're not formed properly okay question uh not all dogs but yes they have dogs that are trained to sniff skin cancer and things like that it can be different types of cancers they can train dogs they have special service dogs that can detect blood sugar issues they have service dogs that can detect epileptic um, seizures when a person's going to have a seizure all kinds of stuff, okay? All right, moving on. Types of bones, four types. Long, short, flat, irregular, and sesamoid bones. Oops, okay? So if you're at home, you can pause, catch up, and then we'll talk in a second while I pause in class for everybody to write this down. Okay, so this is our picture of our um, bones. I've got to unfreeze my screen up here. So the different types of bone, this is very easy to understand, yes? Not, not complicated at all. This is where we start to get a little bit more complicated. And I'm gonna zoom through this slide 
Um, you pause at home to get all of those words, okay? You pause the video at home. Those of you who are here, we're going to look at the picture and we're going to talk about all the words. Question? <coughs> okay. So we're going to discuss all of those vocabulary terms while we're looking at an actual picture of a bone. All right. First off, at the ends of our bones, we have a layer of cartilage. We call that articular cartilage articular cartilage. You have find articular cartilage at the ends of the bone so that the bone, when it's sliding at a joint, it's going to protect the bone so you don't have bone grinding on bone, which is incredibly painful. But also, it's going to allow for the joint to smooth really, really, uh, to smoothly uh, flex at that point. So um, articulations are joints, okay? Arthro also means joint, so arthritis is inflammation at the joint. A bone is divided up into two portions, the epiphysis and the diaphysis. The epiphysis are the ends, or epiphyses are the ends of the bones. And the diaphysis we also know as the shaft of the bone. So the bones that we're going to be looking at in class will be cut like this one, in half, longitudinally. And then the um, butcher is going to cut them in half again here. So I'll get four pieces from each long bone. So that's enough for four lab tables. But depending upon which end of the bone you get, you're either going to get a hip portion or a knee portion. So you want to look at both. So you can see the knee joint as well as the hip joint. And the ones I've gotten in the past will still have parts of the um, joint capsule intact. So it's, it's pretty cool with chunks of meat on it and everything. Boy, I could just stew them down and, and make an awesome stock with, with the bones. But, and it doesn't smell bad because it's not in chemicals. It's fresh. So it smells basically like a steak. Ooh. Ew, a steak. I love steak. Oh, like, ooh, okay. I saw, I heard, ooh, too. Okay, moving on. Moving on, the, um, so the epiphyses are the ends of the bone, the diaphysis is the shaft of the bone. Along the outside of the bone, okay, lining the entire outside of the bone, is our compact bone, with the most compact bone being in the shaft. At the ends of the bone, though, we have spongy bone. Spongy bone is where we find our red marrow. Yes, that is hard to see. Let me erase that and I'll write it in white. So the spongy bone is where we find our red marrow. And I found out that the uh, microphone, I think, is this little dot here. And so I have to be really careful about how I hold my iPad because I was told in one of my videos it came out very muffled. And I think it's because I put my finger over this. And so if it's coming out muffled now, you guys will have to tell me. If you listen to this, if you can hear my voice coming in and out, it's because I had my finger over the microphone. Inside of our shaft, we find our yellow marrow, and this is um, lots of fat in our yellow marrow. So when you're starving to death, the very last fat reserve that you're gonna, your body is going to tap into is going to be your yellow marrow. This is why dogs love to chew on bones. This is why hyenas love to chew on bones. Daryl, you need to put in your ID number and bubble it. Yeah. Yellow marrow, which is mostly fat. Has anybody ever eaten osobuco? Osobuco. Okay, oso buco is where they take a section of a veal calf. Do you know what a veal calf is? It's a, it's a, it's a calf. It's a very young cow um, that has been kept confined and fed a special diet so that its um, muscle doesn't get uh, tough. It's very tender, and it's actually white. It doesn't, it, its meat is white. It's, it looks more like pork than beef. And they feed them um, extra milk and grain, and so they, they have a very good, um, tender-tasting meat. 
And then they keep them in cages, veal cages. Thank you. And so Osabuco, I believe they take the shank, a section of the thigh, and they cook it really low temperature for a very long time. And then they give you this tiny little fork called a marrow fork. So after you eat all the tender meat from the outside, you take your fork and you dip into the fat in the, in the bone cavity, then you can spread it on bread and it's like butter. It's really, really, really good. So that's osobuco. Okay, the periosteum. Bones are good. I mean, bones add a lot of flavor to food. You know, if you're gonna make a, a soup and you wanna make your own stock, what do you start out with? Bones. Okay. So if you wanna make a really awesome um, stock, you have to have good bones because that's what adds the flavor and the fat, and fat, fat adds flavor. Yes? Posterior, medial, lateral, distal. Actually, this is not posterior, this is proximal. So this is the, the, the this top end of the bone here is the proximal end closer to the trunk of the body. This is the, dis the bottom end here is the distal end. So that's the knee. Medial towards the midline of the body, lateral towards the, so it's giving, it, this is your compass rose to give you your directional terms. Okay, I'm gonna erase these writings because it's getting too messy. Okay, the periosteum. The periosteum is a membrane that covers the surface of the whole bone. And then you have an inner layer called the endoosteum. Uh, and last but not least, the epiphyseal line. The epiphyseal line is interesting because do you guys remember what all bone starts out as when we're developing embryonically? Cartilage, hyaline cartilage. And when you're bone, bone, when you're born, you don't have, you have more bones than when you have as an adult. And that's because your bones grow together. Your bones fuse. So bones will start out as cartilage and then move, uh, the cartilage ossifies and turns into bone from the shaft outwards. When it gets to the ends of the bones, you'll have a line of cartilage. And while you're still growing, you'll have this line of cart cartilage here called an epiphyseal plate. Once you're done growing and you've reached your, meet, met your maximum height, that epiphyseal plate hardens or ossifies and becomes compact bone and then it be co becomes called the epiphyseal line and that's how a doctor can look at an x-ray of your long bones and they'll know if you're done growing or not so if you fall down and you have to get something x-rayed ask ask the doctor to pull up your x-ray to ask if you're done growing yet and then wow them with your amazing knowledge of of anatomy by saying how would you can you see my epiphyseal plate and they'll be like, ooh. And then you can say, oh, it's all, all because of Mrs. Zitterkopf, the best anatomy teacher ever. Okay, microscopic anatomy of bone. Here you can see what kind of bone in this picture. Does it look solid and hard? Or does it look like sponge? Sponge. sponge. So is it compact bone or spongy bone? Spongy. It's spongy bone. And what kind of marrow do you find in spongy bone? Red, Red marrow. Okay, in this picture also though, you can see there's compact bone on the lower one. So you find compact bone in the shaft of the bone and spongy bone all around the edges. Uh, it's dense, so the compact bone is, you can see right here, right? And you can see the outline here, there's compact bone. So there's compact bone outlining the entire bone. This is the spongy bone though, yeah? So bone types, spongy bone and compact bone. I'll pause while you write this down and then we'll talk about it. Oops. Google Classroom. All right, so spongy bone, what it's responsible for, it's really important and it's not on this slide, but spongy bone gives strength to the bone without adding extra weight. If all of our bone was compact bone, it would just be too heavy for us to move around. So we have spongy bone at the ends of bones and it's still very, very strong and it's hard. It's not soft like a sponge. It's hard, but it's not as heavy as all the, if our bone was all compact bone. 
In the trabeculae, the spaces, um, we have, that's where we have our red marrow, okay? And your quiz is gonna be on, on Wednesday on the structure of a long bone. Where would you find spongy bone? Where would you find, you know, what's the epiphysis? What's the diaphysis? But then also, it's gonna be on this last thing that I wanna get a chance to talk about, and I'm, I'm running behind. So you guys are gonna have to listen to the end of this lecture online tonight, okay? Osteoporosis, okay? This is mentioned a little bit in your textbook, but not, not very much. You guys have all heard of it, but you don't really know what it is. How do you prevent osteoporosis? When you get osteoporosis, do you want osteoporosis? No. no, you know you don't want it. Okay, you get osteoporosis from not having enough calcium, but that's not your only risk factor. Okay, osteo means bone, porous means holes. So osteoporosis is literally going from having a good density of bone, like the bone you see on your left, to a bone that's very, very porous with a lot of holes in it. If your bone becomes very porous because of lack of calcium, it's going to break very easily. And this is why people, when they're older, break bones very easily. You fall and you break a hip, you cough, and you crack a rib. Wait, what? It happens. Okay, what are the risk factors for osteoporosis? You're going to want to have this in your notes. Okay, access is the mnemonic. Alcohol use, which you can control. Heavy alcohol use is linked to osteoporosis. Corticosteroid use, this would be medications that people would need for chronic inflammation. You might need to take those for some reason, but it can contribute to osteoporosis because it impedes, I believe, the absorption of calcium. So not having enough calcium does cause your bones to become depleted of calcium. If you're not ingesting, taking in enough calcium, your body is going to get the calcium out of your bones, okay? Low calcium levels, not getting enough foods that are high enough in calcium. If you, you need calcium for muscle contraction too. So your bones are a reservoir, a storage site for calcium. Some of you are already tuned out, that's a mistake. Okay, low levels of estrogen. This happens naturally as a woman ages, right? So this is why we see elderly women with osteoporosis. Smoking, something you don't have to do. And being sedentary. A sedentary lifestyle is when you are sitting around. I'm going to pause and I will finish this lecture and I will post it. Okay, so I had to quit this PowerPoint during class we ran out of time and I'm continuing it now so there's gonna be a lot of noise because I have a club meeting in my classroom okay so I have a club in the background too so sorry so these are the um, things that you're gonna be looking at that are going to lead to an increased risk of osteoporosis which again is having bones that um, look like they have holes in them they become porous and more broken broken more easily Okay, sedentary lifestyle is interesting because they call being sedentary the new type of smoking or just as bad as smoking. So you guys want to move around and you want to um, not smoke and don't drink too much alcohol, especially before you're 21, right? Uh, this is our microscopic anatomy of a bone and there's here we're looking specifically at a close up of just a little bit of spongy bone and then mostly the compact bone. Okay, so this is our up close view of um, the osteon, which is the unit, the growth unit of bone, of compact bone. So it's called the osteon. It's also called sometimes the herversion system. Um, the herversion system or the osteon is found in layers. And since these layers are like rings, one inside of the other, we call these layers the concentric lamellae. Concentric lamellae. All right, so getting back to this, I keep getting stopped, you guys. Sorry about that. This is going to be a terrible recording. So um, the fact that we have layers and one layer fits within the next layer that's called a ring within a ring is called a concentric circle and these are layers so lamellae you have a central canal in the in the middle and in that central canal you'll see there are blood vessels because bones are alive 
And inside of these chambers called lacunae, you have, don't forget that word, lacunae, L-A-C-U-N-A-E. Inside those lacunae, you have osteocytes. What happens is um, the osteoclasts are bone destroyers. They break down bone. Osteoblasts build bone. And osteoblasts, once they get surrounded by bony matrix, they become osteocytes. So osteoblasts become osteocytes. The little chambers, or not chambers, but canals that connect the chambers to each other are called canaliculi. And that's so that diffusion can occur and reach from the central canal all the way out to the outermost cells, okay? Um, that's about it for where we ended up in all the three of the classes. So make sure for your quiz coming up on Wednesday of this week, you know the structure of the long bone as well as the structure microscopically, okay? Sorry about all the interruptions, you guys. Um, I hope this helps.